Dr. Selva is a consultant of OBGYN in uh, Mahakota Hospital in Malacca. He uh, also received uh, initial training in laparoscopy. As Dr. Selva said, she's, uh, he's uh, uh, got uh, laparoscopy from Prof. Li Chilong in Changgung Hospital and from Song Wee Young from, uh, uh, from Taipei also in 1994. And uh, Dr. Selva is the first president of EPITS and of the OBGYN Society of Malaysia. And currently, just is endoscopy committee and is involved in promoting gynecology endoscopy surgery in Surabaya. Okay, Dr. Selva, please, uh, time is yours. You have uh, 20 minutes. And after Dr. Selva talk, we have uh, five or 10 minutes for the question and answer for discussion. Please, Dr. Selva. Okay, Jenny, can I share the, uh, my screen? Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ellie, for your kind introduction. Today, my topic will be intramural fibroid and infertility, to operate or not. Now, we all know that uh, uterine fibroid is the commonest monoclonal tumor in women. Fibroids may be the sole cause of infertility in about 2 to 3% of women. Current literature calls for the removal of submucous fibroids and possibly cavity distorting intramural fibroids to optimize pregnancy outcome. However, removal of non-cavity distorting fibroids, intramural fibroids is still controversial. So when I say non-cavity distort, uh, distorting fibroids, are the fibroids like this that are present in the uterus, but it doesn't distort the endometrial cavity. Now, does this kind of fibroids cause infertility? And should we remove this fibroid? And this will be my discussion today. Now, what is my lecture outline? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give the classification of fibroids, I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology of subfertility in patients with intramural uh, non-cavity distorting fibroids. Then I will answer the question, does intramural fibroids cause infertility? The next question will be, does myomectomy improves the pregnancy rates? And the lastly, I will look at all the other alternatives to myomectomy in patients with uh, cavity distorting fibroids. Now, all this, what I'm talking about is written in a paper, and the paper is also called The Safe Intramural Fibroid and Fertility to Operate or Not, and it's published a few years ago in the, one of the papers. You can, if, you, if you Google this, you can get the whole paper. So whatever I'm going to say is already in, uh, written in this paper. So the first question is, what is the classification of fibroids? Now, traditionally, we know that fibroids are classified into submucous, subserous, intramural, and cervical fibroids. But the FIGO classification is more, uh, more uh, appropriate now. We have all these classifications. Number one and number two are submucous fibroids. Numbers five, six, and seven are subserous fibroids. Number two, although uh, um, more than half will be inside the myometrium, it is also classified as submucous fibroids. Now, number three and number four are the fibroids which we call as intramural fibroids. Number two to five, because the endometrial, uh, endo uh, the myometrium thickness is, ranges from about 1.5 centimeters to about three centimeters. So if it's a big fibroid, it can go from the subserous fibroid to the, uh, to the submucus, and that's what we call as uh, category two to five. So what I'm interested in is in number three and number four. Does fibroids in, uh, categorized as number three and number four, which does not, uh, uh, alter the endometrial cavity, are these fibroids causing infertility? And if it's causing infertility, what can we do about it? So that is my discussion today. So here you can see a patient that I recently uh, uh, saw. This the patient has got a subserous fibroid and she's pregnant. So we know that these subserous fibroids are not a problem. And we know that submucous fibroids we have to remove, okay? So let's move on to the next slide. So I want to talk about pathophysiology. Now, when I talk about pathophysiology, I take most of what my discussion from this paper uh, entitled Potential Causes of Subfertility in Patients with Intramural Fibroid. Now, this is the paper that I will be discussing. And in this paper, there are a few things that we need to discuss. First of all, implantation. Secondly, junctional zone. Third is uterine myometrial peristalsis. Fourth is 
fibroid pseudo capsule and the last is steroid hormone so all these factors will affect uh, a pregnancy in a patient with intramural fibroid now let's look at uh, implantation now implantation is a complex process we all know that all of us who are doing ivf we know that we can create a very beautiful embryo but the embryo don't implant and we don't know why uh, there are many factors that are involved the factors are such as hoxa 9 hoxa 10 glycodulin leukemia inhibitory factor glutathione peroxidase 3 and hoxa 10 is responsible for cellular differentiation why glycodulin is responsible for promoting angiogenesis suppressing natural killer cells and inhibiting the binding of somatozoa to the zona pellucida so normally these two factors are reduced during the follicular phase and increased during the implantation phase and what happens is that when the patient has got an intramural fibroid both hoxa 10 and glycodulin are reduced during implantation and because they are reduced they may be the cause of a patient with intramural fibroid not getting pregnant. So Lex, Lex looks at the junctional zone. Now we know that the junctional is an area next to the endometrial cavity. It is seen very clearly in an uh, MRI scan. And there are peristalsis in the junctional zone. And this, this peristalsis originates in the junctional zone. And disruption of the junctional zone by fibrosis may lead to increased peristalsis. So if there's anything that disrupts this, uh, this uh, uh, junctional zones, for example, adenomyosis or fibroid can increase, uh, 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 increase uterine peristalsis. Thickening of the junctional zone also caused by intramural fibroid may lead to poor reproductive outcome. NK cells are, were reduced and macrophages were increased in endometrium closer to fibroids compared to other areas. So this may be another reason why a patient with intramural fibroids cannot get pregnant. Now let's look at this junctional zone. Again, uh, we know that type 3 and type 4 fibroids, type 3 fibroids are the ones that actually touches the endometrial cavity. Now type 4 fibroids do not touch the endometrial cavity. I have postulated that type 4 fibroids can be divided into two types, 4A and 4B. Now 4A are the ones that I think should touches the junctional zone and 4B does not. So this is my own classification. I think that 4A, those fibroids that touches the junctional zone, will have a higher incidence of difficulty in getting pregnant than 4B. Okay, next let's look at myometrial peristalsis. Now there are two types of uterine contractions. One is called the focal and sporadic bulging of the myometrium. And the second is the rhythmic and subtle stripping movement in the subendometrial myometrium. And this is called the uterine peristalsis. Now, uterine peristalsis is captured by CINI MRI. And CINI, here you can see CINI MRI are MRI that are doing repeatedly to catch the movement of the endometrium. And this is a very laborious and expensive process. Now, what we know is that from menstruation to the mid ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle, the uterus contracts from the cervix to the fundus with increasing frequency. And because of this, the sperm can move from the cervix towards the fundus. Post ovulation contraction frequency decreases to relatively quiet, especially during implantation. So during implantation phase, the contraction is very minimal. And in the luteal phase, the direction of the peristalsis is reversed. That means it travels from the tube into the fundus and into the cervix so that it will help the embryo to move from the, uh, uh, from the uh, cephalopian tube into the endometrium. Uh, can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know, my computer, my uh, internet, this has happened twice already. Okay, sorry, I will, I will go back to the previous slides. As I said, uh, this paper by Yoshino entitled, Decreased Pregnancy Rate is Linked to Abnormal Uterine Peristalsis Caused by Intramural Fibroid. And in this nice paper, what mm -hmm. Dr. Yoshino did is that he took uh, 95 infertile patients with uterine fibroids, and then he did uh, 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 magnetic resonance imaging on them. Out of that, he found that 51 patients fulfilled the criteria, out of which 29 patients were assigned, were found to have uh, less uterine peristalsis, which is zero or one, and 22 patients have high frequency, which is two or more, more times per minute uterine peristalsis. So. He, in, so after that, he found, and then he make them uh, try to get pregnant without IVF, just by normal pregnancy. And the, in the patients who have 
uh, a low uterine peristalsis, that is the 29 patients who have low uterine peristalsis, uh, 34 per, uh, 10 out of the 29 patients got pregnant. That means 34% got pregnant. Whereas none of the patients who have a high peristalsis got pregnant. So here he concluded that a high frequency of uterine peristalsis during the mid luteal phase might be one of the causes of infertility associated with intramural fibroids. So I, I hope you understand. So basically he took patients and he did a CINI MRI. And in that CINI MRI, 50, uh, 29 patients had a high, as a low uh, uh, peristalsis and 22 patients has got a high peristalsis. And out of the patients with high peristalsis, none of them got pregnant, whereas 10 patients, that is 34 patients actually conceived. So he concluded as if there is uterine peristalsis in a patient with uterine fibroid, small uterine fibroid, they will have a difficulty in getting pregnant. Sorry, I'll move on to this. Okay, next is fibroid pseudocapsule. We all know what is fibroid pseudocapsule. A fibroid pseudocapsule is a capsule around an intramural fibroid. Now we know that uh, these capsules contain smooth muscles and neurotransmitters. And they are very vascular and they've got upregulation with uh, endogolin and the CD34. If the pseudocapsule thickness also varies according to the location of the fibroid, it is thicker in the submucous fibroid compared to intramural fibroid compared to subserous fibroid. And cervical fibroid have got the thickest pseudocapsule. So the presence of pseudocapsule with cytokines, growth factors, and hormones may be responsible for abnormal uterine peristalsis, which may cause premature deliveries in women with intramural fibroids. So when a patient has got a very thick pseudocapsule, they have got a higher chance of uh, increased uterine peristalsis and also increased chance of premature deliveries and also uh, difficulty in getting pregnant. So the neurotransmitters in uh, pseudocapsule is important in promoting inflammation and proper wound healing. And also it's important to do an intracapsular myomectomy without excising the pseudocapsule to reduce intraoperative blood loss, to enhance better uterine healing and also correct musculature anatomical restoration to preserve uterine functionality for reproductive purpose. So the pseudocapsule is important when we do myomectomy, but it's also important in causing uterine peristalsis. So next we look at steroid hormones. Now we know that fibroid tissue contain a higher concentration of aromatase, estrogen, estrogen receptor alpha, beta, and also progesterone receptor compared to the surrounding healthy environment. Fibroid is also, we all know that estrogen dependent, but studies have shown, Ishikawa did a very nice study and it shows that actually you need both estrogen and progesterone for fibroid growth. So what he did is that he took a mice and then he make them, uh, uh, make them uh, less responsive to uh, uh, progesterone and uh, estrogen. And then he implanted them with, fi uh, the, with uh, fibroids. And only when you give both estrogen and uh, progesterone did the fibroid grow. So high estrogen levels stimulates the junctional zone and induces rapid uterine contraction and progesterone antagonizes its effect and suppresses uterine contractility. I think all IVF specialists will know that we give a lot of progesterone to patients to suppress uterine contraction so that when we do an embryo transfer, the embryo will implant. But we know the high estrogens will cause uterine contraction. This is also one of the problems in uh, implantation when we do IVF. So the next question to ask is, does intramural non-cavity distorting fibroid cause infertility? So here we can see all the papers that shows that intramural fibroid reduces fertility outcome. And here we have all the studies that show that it does not affect fertility. So when we have this kind of studies, when there are so many studies with contradicting effect, what we will look for, we will look for review articles and meta-analysis. So this is the first meta-analysis that came out. It is by Sunkara et al. It, it, it is entitled, The Effect of Intramural Fibroids Without Uterine Cavity Involvement on the Outcome of IVF Treatment, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. So here, patients who are undergoing IVF with intramural fibroids, but they are not ca cavity distorting fibroids. She analyzed, and this is what she, come, she came to a conclusion. She said that the presence of non-cavity distorting fibroids is associated with an adverse pregnancy outcome in women undergoing IVF treatment. So this is another paper, this is from China, and this is published more recently, which is 2018. 
And the title of this uh, paper is The Impact of Non-Cavity Distorting Intramural Fibroids on the Efficacy of IVF and Embryo Transfer and Updated Meta-Analysis. So in the conclusion from this study, this meta-analysis is that the present evidence suggests that non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids would significantly reduce the implantation rate, clinical pregnancy rate, and live birth rate, and significantly increase the miscarriage rate after IVF treatment, but it will not significantly increase anthropic pregnancy rate. So what it tells is that the presence of intramural fibroids, even if it is non-cavity distorting, will affect the pregnancy rate. So the next question to ask is, okay, now we know that a small intramural fibroids affects fertility. Does myomectomy improve the pregnancy rates? This is a very important question. Doesn't mean that you go and remove the fibroids, you will get better pregnancy rate. And here again, the literature is divided. There's a lot of papers that say that, yes, if you do myomectomy, you will improve pregnancy rates. Whereas there are also studies that say that it does not. It doesn't mean that you do myomectomy, it will, it will not affect pregnancy rate. So how do you answer this question? So let's go back to this uh, uh, gentleman called Yoshino, who remember I told you earlier, he did a study, he did CINI MRI, and he found that all the patients with high peristalsis actually did not get pregnant. So what he did is he took all these patients, 15 patients with increased peristalsis, and then he did a myomectomy on them. And he did the second MRI after that, and and he found that six out of the 15 patients who have reduced peristalsis after the operation had achieved a pregnancy. So the among 15 patients, the frequency of uterine peristalsis was normalized in 14 patients and following myomectomy and the second MRI test, six out of the patients achieved pregnancy. So he, included, he concluded that the presence of uterine fibroids might induce abnormal uterine peristalsis leading to fertility and myomectomy may improve the fertility in these patients. So what does this all this tell us so far? Now, what we have, what I've, in the discussion, what I've told you all is that intramural fibroids actually decreases pregnancy rates. And when an intramural fibroids increase uterine peristalsis, the pregnancy rates in, decreases. But, and we are unsure whether myomectomy in these patients improve pregnancy rates. So if there is increase in uterine peristalsis in patients with intramural fibroid, chances that myomectomy may improve pregnancy rates is better. Only problem is that we cannot measure uterine peristalsis because CINI MRI is difficult and expensive. So we know that uh, presence of fibroid decreases pregnancy rate, and we know that if the fibroid increases the peristalsis, then it will decrease pregnancy rate, and so we will do myomectomy. But unfortunately, we don't have a good method to measure the uh, uterine, uh, measure the uterine peristalsis. So instead of doing that, can we do alternative method for removing the fibroid? Instead of doing a myomectomy, can we use other methods to shrink the fibroid? And these are the five methods that I have. You can use ulipristal acetate. You can use gonadotropin-releasing hormones or GnRH analog. You can use etosiban. You can use uterine artery embolization, or you can use HIFU, high-intensity focus ultrasound. So I'll discuss each one of this one by one. Now let's look at ulipristal acetate. Now this is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. The advantage of myomectomy is that the patient can conceive immediately after treatment. There's, there have been case reports where type two and type three fibroids, where they give ulipristal and this type two and type three fibroids became smaller and then the patient has conceived. And these are the papers that have come out, but we do not know whether it works on type 4 fibroids. But the only problem is that even in my country, it has been withdrawn from the market because of the worry of liver failure. So we don't have ulipristal. But if you have ulipristal acetate in your country, then you may want to consider using ulipristal acetate in patients with type 4 fibroids, shrink it, and then allow the patient to get pregnant. So this is one choice. The next choice is to use gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH. Now, GnRH analog binds to GnRH receptor causing desensitization and ultimately reducing the estrogen and progesterone causing reduction in fibroid growth. GnRH analog also acts on the GnRH receptor expressed by the fibroid to reduce cellular proliferation. During the process, water diffuses out of the fibroid cells causing shrinkage of the fibroid. 
Since there's lack of studies to determine the effect of GnRH analog on fertility, we postulate that significant reduction of fibroid volume by GnRH may reduce the impact of cavity encroaching fibroid and subsequently improve implantation. So there's been no study looking at GnRH for intramural fibroids, shrinking them and see whether they get pregnant. So this is an area where we can do research and this is something you can try. This study by Castle in three out of five patients uh, with fibroid can successfully conceive, two of them conceived without surgical intervention. So this is something that we can consider in patients with intramural fibroid. Next is etosiban. Now, etosiban is actually a combined oxytocin and vasopressin receptor antagonist. As an oxytocin receptor antagonist, etosiban competes with oxytocin at the oxytocin receptor in the endometrial cells to decrease endometrial contraction and prevent embryo expulsion during the implantation phase. By reducing the oxytocin effect, it inhibits oxytocin-induced prostaglandin production and increases the endometrial blood supply. As a vasopressin antagonist, etosiban relaxes the uterine arteries and decreases the systolic blood pressure to improve blood perfusion to the endometrium and myometrium. So the antagonistic effect of oxytocin and vasopressin receptor may improve uterine receptivity and embryo implantation. So now we know that uh, uterine peristalsis is a very important factor in patients with intramural fibroid and fertility. So can we use etosiban to reduce the uterine uh, peristalsis so that they get pregnant. Unfortunately, all the studies that have been done are for repeated implantation failures. There's been no studies to look at uterine peristalsis, but this is something that we can look at. We can use etosiban in patients with uh, intramural fibroids and they are not getting pregnant and we can give etosiban after embryo transfer to help patients to conceive. Next is uterine artery embolization. Now, uterine artery embolization is believed to affect embryonic implantation and difficulty in maintaining gestation, leading to increased miscarriages. The risk of amenorrhea and ovarian failure after UAE is in young women is also low. However, there's a worry of poor oocyte quality and poor response to ovarian stimulation in patients who undergo uterine artery embolization. There has been several cases of intrauterine additions, endometrial atrophy, and fistula between the uterine cavity and embolized myoma post UAE are described in the literature. In one study, more than one third patient were found to have intracavity tissue necrosis three to nine months post UAE. So the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Society of Interventional Radiology, and the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology have placed UAE as a relative contraindication for women desiring future fertility. So if a patient has got an intramural fibroid, we will probably won't advise uterine artery embolization, especially young women, because we are, we are worried about the ovarian failure. So finally, let me look at high intensity focus ultrasound or HIFU, which is our, our webinar today. Now, HIFU is an organ sparing, non-invasive thermal ability procedure. It uses extra corporal transducers to focus a big intensity ultrasound beam to the targeted myoma to thermally ablate the tumors without introducing needles or probes into the tumor. MRI, uh, there are two types of HIFU, this MRI HIFU and ultrasound-based HIFU. There is minimal damage to the surrounding normal myometrium without obvious damage to the elastic and collagen fibers in the normal uterine muscle, resulting in less scar tissue formation and less risk of collagen fiber hyperplasia. Theoretically, this would reduce the pregnancy risk in women who have undergone high food treatment for uterine fibroids as compared to myomectomy. Clinical studies have confirmed that HIFU avoids ovarian function impairment and adverse reaction thus preserve ability to conceive. So studies have also shown that pregnancy rate post HIFU is 95.4%, which is still higher than that post myomectomy, which is 64% to 88%. So spontaneous abortion rate post HIFU is 14.9%, is similar to post myomectomy, 13 to 24%. This rate is still significantly lower than pregnancy with untreated fibroid, which is 20 to 46%. So high intensity focus ultrasound appear to be a good modality which we can use to shrink these small fibroids. Instead of doing a big laparoscopic myomectomy or open myomectomy for a small fibroid, we could use HIFU to shrink the fibroids and then the patient can get pregnant. So what are my uh, conclusions? There are enough evidence to show to tell that non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids affect fertility. Type 3 may be 
a high risk for poor pregnancy outcome compared to type 4 fibroids. There are many possible causes why intramural fibroids affect fertility, but the only measurable cause appears to be uterine peristalsis. All others cannot be measured. Unfortunately, not all patients with intramural fibroids have increased uterine peristalsis. So currently, there's no good or, or inexpensive method of measuring uterine peristalsis. The only good method is expensive, which is CD MRI. We can use transvaginal ultrasound method, it is cheaper, but the modality is still very user dependent. So it's not very good method to detect uterine peristalsis. A better method needs to be devised to measure uterine peristalsis easily and effectively. So now we have vitrification and a lot of us and IVF are now doing almost all frozen embryo transfers and this frozen embryo transfer is improving. So I suggest that Myomectomy should not be the first line treatment for patients with small intramural fibroid. In patients with many frozen embryo, the strategy could be to consider surgical or non-surgical intervention only in patients who have failed embryo transfer. So if your patient has got a small intramural fibroid, you do an embryo transfer, but if it's, it fails or keep failing, then you must consider whether you want to do myomectomy or you want to do HIFU. And myomectomy appear to be a big procedure to perform for small intramural fibroids. So of all the non-surgical methods that I described above, HIFU appears to be the most attractive option to shrink small intramural fibroids because it is non-invasive technique and has very few side effects. So this need to be explored in clinical studies. And this is what I'm going to do uh, because I've just installed the JC200 machine. In fact, we just started doing a HIFU last week and we have done eight cases so far. And my, my interest is here. I want to try and see whether we could shrink small fibroids and help a patient to conceive. Thank you. Back to you, Rally. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Selva, for your very interesting uh, talk about uh, fibroid. Uh, and, you know, uh, we have uh, so many problems fibroid with infertility. Okay, we open for the uh, discussion, question and answer. We have uh, five minutes to do uh, discussion. Is everyone have any question? You can uh, raise hand. Okay, there is one question here. Uh, is from Dr. Indra from Indonesia. I think it's my oh, yeah. friend, Dr. Indra from Sumarang. How many intramural fiber can you shrink with HIFU? Okay, I think Professor Zhang Lian will be discussing this uh, in a little while. But uh, I mean, from what little that I've been doing in these last few weeks, we can actually do many, many fibroids, uh, four, five, six fibroids. It all depends on location, the response of the fibroid. And uh, sometimes uh, we can do many, we, we, we can do many fibroids at one time. So all depends on the uh, response of the fibroid. And I'm sure Professor Zhang Lian, who is uh, an expert in this, will probably answer your question later, uh, Dr. Indra. So there's another, uh, yes, yeah, uh, another, another question by Dr. Indra is, can HIFU manage adhesions? No, HIFU cannot manage adhesions. We, from what I see, we can shrink fibroid and adenomyces. As fertility specialists, I, I think adenomyces is one of the bigger headaches. Uh, we can help to shrink fibroids and we also can uh, shrink adenomyces, but uh, it will not deal with intrauterine adhesions. In fact, if you, if you ablate, uh, if you use HIFU on the endometrium, it can cause additions in the endometrium. So we have to avoid um, uh, and, uh, the HIFU treatment of the endometrium. Now, uh, how can we train uh, in HIFU treatment? Um, very good question. Uh, you need to go to Chongqing uh, to get the training. You can uh, 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 contact APH or you can contact uh, 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 I, uh, Inter International Society of Minimally Invasive uh, Therapy, and they can arrange for you to uh, do the training. If you go and do training, it's not a not no point because uh, only when you get the machine, you go, should go training. So my my thinking is you must try to purchase the machine or get a machine into a center and then go for the training. I went for the training uh, last year in January last year. And only, uh, the, only now I'm doing it and I've forgotten everything I did the training for. So there's no point going for training until you are very sure that you are going to get a machine in your center. When do you do ET after HIFU? Now, uh, uh, I'm still exploring, but I'm sure you can do uh, 
two, three, four months after the HIFU. When we are doing HIFU, we are trying to shrink the fibroid. The fibroid will take some time, uh, three months, four months, five months to shrink. So once it has shrunk, then you can do the HIFU treatment. Uh, we know the oxytocin receptor uh, is minimal in non-pregnant uterus. How does Atosiban works then? Or what is your personal opinion, doctor? Now, um, good question. I have actually used a few uh, atosiban for patients with um, uh, implantation failure. Now, um, whether atosiban works on uh, uh, works to reduce uterine peristalsis is not uh, is not been proven. We don't have any studies. Maybe somebody will need to do studies. But atosiban actually works on poor implantation failure. And atosiban, as you know, is a oxytocin and vasopressin. Uh, receptor antagonist. So if there is no uh, uh, or there's minimal uh, receptors in the uterus, in a non-pregnant uterus, there, there must be some patients which have got more receptors uh, that is causing this uterine peristalsis and that's why this works. And I can give you a little bit of experience. I just, as I told you, I just started doing a HIFU just last week and we actually use oxytocin to compress the uterus when we do the high food treatment and it works. I can, I can actually see that when we use oxytocin in a non-pregnant uh, uterus, it works. So I think there is uh, receptors in the uterus, uh, even in a non-pregnant patient. And uh, so I, I'm thinking whether atosiban will work. So I, I, that's all the answer that I can, I can give you. Uh, okay. Dear Dr. Dr. Selva, yeah. Uh, one, one, one question. Last then. question, last question. Yes. Dear Dr. Yes. Selva, any data on fibroid recurrence rate after uh, successful HIFU treatment? I think Dr. Jiang, uh, uh, Jiang Lian will answer this question. Uh, we know that the success rate is in the region of 85 to 90% of ablated fibroid. There's still some fibroids that may recur, uh, but the, the, the numbers are actually very small. If you have done a complete ablation, say 80% to 90% ablation, very high chance that recurrence will not occur. But of course, we cannot uh, say that the fibroid may or come back in a different place. That one we will not be able to know. Okay, I can't answer this question. I'll, I'll reply this answer in, yeah. in the chat box and I will now uh, pass it back to Dr. Reilly to introduce, or maybe I will introduce the yeah, next yeah. Speaker, Dr. Zhang Lian. Yeah. 